they've run out of road to kick the can down, basically. And so you're just seeing a, a, a very strong collapse of the enabling environment that you need in order to do proper agriculture there. And, and in Ghana, it's, it's significantly worse, actually, even than in Cote d'Ivoire. And so these two major cocoa producer nations are seeing a strong decline. And so with this strong decline, the prices started going up. Uh, at the world market. And the price, like generally speaking, goes somewhere between 2,000, 3,000 over the last decade or decade and a half. That's kind of the parameters, which is significantly lower than it used to be. But over time, these commodity prices have been dipping anyway. But so we're at somewhere between 2,000, 3,000 dollars regularly. This year, we've seen it go well above 10,000 dollars at least twice just in the last three months. Mm -hmm. um, because Basically, there is absolutely not enough cocoa to go around at the moment. This episode is proudly brought to you by Mapper Forward's workshop, It's Time to Become a Coffee Consultant. Learn how to diversify your revenue streams and create freedom from your day job while saying goodbye to that alarm clock forever by becoming a consultant within the coffee industry or directly to consumers who have shifted towards home brewing and home roasting. Protect your income from challenging times in the coffee value chain by taking this course today. Go to mapperforward.coffee forward slash workshops or click the link in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode two of a five part series with Anthony Fountain from the Voice Network. We are talking about cacao. And in the last episode, we kind of laid the landscape for what the ind industry looks like. On a very high level, we didn't go very deep. Now we're going to start the deep dive. <coughs> Excuse me. So, Bless you. Anthony, we started talking about uh, very, very uh, briefly the fact that the price of cacao has gone up. And mm -hmm. that it is traded in a futures market, but there is a cash market and it's very easy to get around the futures market for cacao. Something happened earlier this year. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, the thing that actually happened started happening last year. And okay. the, 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 the trigger of this was the, the Pacific Ocean weather pattern called El Nino, which mm -hmm. kind of doesn't just affect weather in Latin America, which is what a lot of people think, but it actually affects a lot of global rainfall mm -hmm. across the world. And in fact, we're having like an incredibly cold, wet spring and early summer here in Northwestern Europe because of the El Nino, which is warmer sea temperatures in right. the Pacific around near uh, the Galapagos Islands, right? Mm -hmm. But what it's also done is it's created very destabilized rainfall patterns in West Africa. Um, okay. If you if you look, cocoa is a crop that's very uh, sensitive to rainfall pattern changes, right? Which also means that it's a crop very sensitive to climate change in general. Um, but this El Nino has hit has had more impact than most. Now, if you look at all of the other cocoa producer nations, there's a slight dip in production, but not that much. But kind of what you would expect from an El Nino year, and El Nino years tend to have a lower yields than a non-El Nino year. And it had been a long time since there was an El Nino year. So people had been going like, it's about time we had a bad crop so that the prices would go up a bit. Literally what one of the big companies told me just a year and a half ago. Um, we knew that at some point this was gonna happen. This is part of the cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then it hit West Africa and the effects were catastrophic. Uh, the, 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 the pr production in the two major cocoa producer nations, because in the last episode I said that cocoa is highly concentrated into about eight countries. In reality, it's highly concentrated into about two countries. Cote Which two and countries? Ghana, oh, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Ghana, neighboring countries in West Africa produce together about 60% of the world's cocoa. I mean, mm. this is like, an insane kind of duopoly on production. Um, and they actually, they've started forming a cartel together a couple of years ago. We might get to that later in the, in the show or not, but that's irrelevant to what's happening in the market right now. Mm -hmm. um, cocoa production in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire just tanked. Um, it's still hard to get the complete numbers, but 
30 to 40, and in some cases of farms, 50 to 60% reduction of yields um, uh, last year. And to be honest, the rainfall patterns have been highly destabilized there, much more than normal. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that tanked. And you can't just point at one thing. So I, say, I, I started with El Nino, which is also the argument that most of the governments there are giving, because it's much easier to blame the weather than to blame your own policies. But policies have definitely made a difference there as well. Um, and so what's happened there is it's been a lot hotter and wetter than normal. No, mm -hmm. and wet and hot circumstances are perfect breeding grounds for crop diseases and pests as well, right? So mm. they thrive in that kind of environment. Um, and so there's been an outbreak or a kind of a, an exacerbation of outbreaks of tree pandemics like uh, the co cocoa swollen shoot virus and the black pod disease. But this is made even worse by the fact that since the global pandemic and the Ukraine war, there's been a double whammy of a huge cost of living crisis and a cost of production crisis in West Africa, even more than in most other parts of the world. And so farmers have, who are already desperately poor, are then hit even harder by this cost of living crisis. But because of the war in the Ukraine, agrochemicals are no longer available. Um, and so, and even if they would be available, they would be completely unaffordable. And so, co coupled with this, Insane weather pattern that's driving forward these crop diseases. All of a sudden, there's like no crop protection available to farmers mm -hmm. at all anymore. So all of these things are starting to cause a perfect storm. Added to that, that in Ghana, um, there's a huge and a, and a strongly increasing encroachment on agricultural lands by open scale mining, which sometimes romantically is called like artisanal small scale mining. But basically what you do is you see a place that resembles a forest. And then by the time you're finished, it resembles a moon landscape with mm. heavily polluted chemicals and, 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 and pools and puddles all over the place. It's terrible for child labor as well, et cetera. So it's like all of these things are coming together. And the governments in West Africa, to a large extent, have never really done a good job at putting in place proactive rural development strategies, plans for resilience, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things are starting to come together that you could hide behind your bad infrastructure. You could hide your kind of corruption and lack of transparency and accountability because you just kept cutting down new pieces of the rainforest and growing mm -hmm. new plantations, et cetera. Um, but the rainforests have been cut down in Ghana and in Cote d'Ivoire. Like Cote d'Ivoire has maybe three to 5% of their original old growth rainforest remaining. And all of that has gone in the last four or five decades, right? So, um, They've run out of road to kick the can down, basically. And so you're just seeing a, a, a very strong collapse of the enabling environment that you need in order to do proper agriculture there. And in Ghana, it's, it's significantly worse, actually, even than in Cote d'Ivoire. And so these two major cocoa producer nations are seeing a strong decline. And so with this strong decline, the prices started going up. Uh, at the world market. And the price, like generally speaking, goes somewhere between 2,000, 3,000 over the last decade or decade and a half. That's kind of the parameters, which is significantly lower than it used to be. But over time, these commodity prices have been dipping anyway. But so we're at somewhere between 2,000, $3,000 regularly. This year, we've seen it go well above $10,000 at least twice just in the last three months. Mm -hmm. um, because Basically, there is absolutely not enough cocoa to go around at the moment. And so the, the, the stores are being depleted. Um, you can actually store cocoa for quite a long time. So cocoa can also be quite stable because you can just put a pile of cocoa. And if you, if you store it well, you can use it six, seven, eight, nine years later um, without too much consequence. Not the good stuff, but maybe 2 to 4% of the world uses the good stuff. So like 95% mm -hmm. of the world's cocoa can be stored for quite a long time. Thank you very much. Those stores are running out as well. So companies are just concerned about whether they can meet demand. And so that's driving the price up to insane levels and levels that we haven't. And so you've got normal market cycles where there's a little bit of a demand shortage, supply shortage, et cetera, et cetera. The kind of price dynamics that we're seeing at the moment, and I've been asking a lot of people in the sectors, like, do you know anybody that was trading the last time this happened? And 
there literally is nobody in Coco that was around mm -hmm. the last time this happened, which is in the 1970s. So yeah, it's, it's a very unprecedented once in a lifetime situation. It seems that there is a lot of correlation happening between coffee and cacao. I've been speaking to a lot of coffee producers who also produce cacao. Mm -hmm. And there's some very interesting fuckery going on there with the people mm -hmm. that are coming to uh, ask people who have cacao to buy their cacao. Mm -hmm. So it sounds yep. like the buyers are organizing to try and force people's hands to sell the cacao. I have a question I want you to answer mm -hmm. before I get to the next part of it. Yep. Once a cacao tree has, once what's happened in Cote d'Ivoire and mm -hmm. Ghana has happened, mm -hmm. how long is it before that they can get back to growing cacao normally? It depends on what is wrong, right? So if you've got black pod that's treatable, next year you can be fine again. Oh. Um, Gold mining, you're screwed. Uh, basically, it can take decades to centuries before yep. the land is usable again. Swollen shoot, you're basically going to have to cut down all the trees in your plantation, treat the land well, and then two years later, um, with the right rehabilitation, you can start planting seedlings, which means that three to five years after that, you'll start seeing your first harvest. So basically, swollen shoot, five years, nothing. Um, so those are kind of the different kind of dynamics that are there but um so kind of rainfall pattern weather anomalies that's something that with with you know with the right responses you can get on top of that quite well but so there's it depends on right. on the challenge the big solution here to be very honest is to just start using a lot more diverse and dynamic agroforestry like intercropping, putting, putting big trees in there, et cetera, becoming a lot less focused on one crop. And there's so many different reasons why that works better. You don't need as many agrochemicals. You've got a lot more natural resilience, but also you got big trees around you and big trees are really great climate change mitigation and adaptation mm -hmm. machines. They are fantastic at so many things. They like they create better rainfall patterns. They are much better at storing rainfall anomalies when it comes down. They're great at, 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 at biodiversity. They reduce the temperature mm -hmm. under your canopy significantly. There's just so many reasons why we need to move away from these monoculture green deserts towards places that create a lot more life, literally. So not your question, but I just want to kind of sing the glory of big trees. Well, it's, it's, I'm happy to sing that glory too, because we're going to uh, be bringing a project uh, that's going to, starting in October, going all the way through to the end of March, that's going to be really helping uh, coffee producers and potentially cacao producers with regards mm -hmm. to regenerative agriculture. We're going to be uh, driving that, bring a whole bunch of folks into that. Going back to what we were talking about though, um, with regards to how long that will take, when I was talking to some folks about this project and a regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, and talking to cacao folks, those who did have cacao that was damaged mm -hmm. uh, were telling me that it was somewhere around a six-year journey yep. that then and the majority of the cacao folks in their, uh, you know, their parts of big influential groups around cacao. Mm -hmm. It's a six year journey to get back to growing, uh, or, or actually re being able to be in a position where they can sell cacao again. Correct. So the interesting conversation that I was having with them was about these people who had been coming and organizing as groups of buyers and coming to mm -hmm. them and saying, uh, you have to, you have to sell us your cacao at a reduced price. Now, these mm -hmm. producers did not know that there was an option to sort of go on a kind of strike and just simply mm -hmm. organize themselves and decide not to sell any cacao to any people who were trying mm -hmm. to buy it. And what they realized after I, we were having these conversations, I said, how long is it going to be till you, there's going to be cacao again? It's six years. Six mm -hmm. years, all things being equal, six years before the market returns back to normal. Mm -hmm. 
And what they started to realize was, and what people should expect if you're somebody who buys cacao and you're listening to this, I can tell you from what I've been talking to producers, they're realizing that the power is now in their hands and they realize that they can store cacao in vacuum sealed bags for a long period of time and just mm -hmm. sell it when they need money. Yeah. And this is a very, very exciting moment for producers who do happen to have cacao. Exactly. And that, that last sentence is really important because uh, the reason the price is so high is because there's not that much cacao to sell. So especially in point. Cote d'Ivoire and in Ghana, farmers are in deep trouble because their volumes have gone down considerably. Yeah. And though the world market price is, is high, actually the farm gate prices in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana aren't. And uh, I don't think we have time to explain in detail how that, uh -huh. that's because the Ivorian and Ghanaian government actually have forward selling systems in place. So they actually have pre-sold the cocoa coming off the trees now about two years ago at the yeah. price levels of two years ago, which in normal situations actually does protect the farmer against price shocks. And so in normal situations, it's not per se a bad thing, but we're not in a normal situation now and it's creating a lot of problems. I mean, we're like literally in a once in a lifetime situation. So these farmers are actually starting indeed to realize they have power. And to be honest, just a couple of months ago, uh, March, April, um, when, because there's cocoa comes off the trees in two big crop seasons in West Africa. And you've got the main crop that starts in October, the mid crop that starts in, in, in March, April. And um, based on these forward sales, the Ivorian and Ghanaian government will set a price that is the guaranteed price for farmers, which is also a minimum and a maximum price. It's it's, it's a state it's an regulated, absolute system. right? It's an absolute system. And we didn't know it was a maximum until about two months ago when all of a sudden the Ivorian government said, by the way, this is also a maximum. And all the farmers are going like, hell it is. Um, but what you saw happening in April, the Ivorian government decided not to raise that fixed price, despite what the market had be, was doing. I mean, the, the world market price was at 10,000 at that time and farm gate prices were at like $1,100. And so- Tell me there's not some fuckery going on there. No, well, they, they, the, the problem there is that the Ivorian government has pre-sold the cocoa two years ago, and now they've, got, they've had terrible harvest. And they're still trying to get the cocoa to make good on the contracts they had for last year, let alone for this year. So, they, I mean, they're up the creek without a paddle. I mean, they've, they've played poker and the flop has been put down. The river has been put down. All the cards are at the table and they have no more outs. They're in deep trouble. Um, but... But so they said, sorry, we're not raising the prices. At which point, oh, the, bigger, the biggest farmer unions in Ghana basically said, so you've got a, a national strike of everyone working in the cocoa sector starting tomorrow morning if you don't raise right. the prices. Excellent. And so there was like an emergency meeting in a hotel in, in, in Plateau, which is kind of the central business district in Abidjan. Um, the morning of the strike between some of the largest um, farmer unions and the cocoa, uh, the CCC, which is the, uh, the Ivorian uh, uh, cocoa regulator from the government side. And they're like, okay, so we're going to raise the price by a good 50%. Um, will you take away the thing? Now this 50% raise does not come out of the profits of the cocoa, uh, of the CCC. This actually is, they're subsidizing. Despite these high prices, the Ivorian and the Ghanaian governments are actually subsidizing farm gate cocoa prices at the moment because they've actually pre-sold the cocoa two years ago. It's it's a very complex situation. To, and to be honest, it's very hard to find a good solution how you're going to solve this without insolvency. And Ghana is on the brink of teetering to complete bankruptcy because they need these foreign exchange of their cocoa sales mm. and they've got no cocoa to sell. Well, and this is, a, it's a very interesting time as you see farmers who have been uh, going into regenerative farming over, and mm -hmm. particularly the farmers that I've been talking to who are growing coffee and cacao. Mm -hmm. And I've been having conversations with them about how expensive it was to transition to regenerative farming, mm -hmm. how, you know, it's it's not a one season kind of step. You've got to yep. take the losses up front as you're doing the the transition. And now they are starting to see the benefits of doing that because mm -hmm. they have cocoa. Well, the, the big challenge that we're seeing right now, because what we've been talking about so far is West Africa, is Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Yeah. The rest of the world, farmers are doing fantastically, thank you very much, with these high market prices, as you could possibly probably mm. imagine. 
But the challenge there is that they're getting such a good price for their conventional cocoa that it's disincentivizing them to remain in the sustainability programs, in the regenerative ag yeah. program, because it takes a lot of hard work. And why would you do that hard work if you can get a really good price for conventional cocoa as well? Right. So that's the challenge is, particularly in Latin America that we're hearing about, is that farmers are like, oh, screw regen, screw sustainability, screw traceability. We're just going to sell because it's good. And there, there's a danger there too. It's, it's not only great for the rest of the world. There's challenges there because, and this is what I see in Europe as well. If you just leave farming unregulated, it also has consequences for the environment. And yeah. so, um, so you need to find the right balance. balance between these different principles that you hold dearly, like environmental protection and treating your farm as well. And you can't go all in on one and forget about the other. That works both ways, by the way. You can't right. go all in on nature and say, through the farmer, because that's also no. going to get you in, into trouble. So yes, go all in on nature, but then make sure that you have the right um, business case for farmers so that you can protect nature. I agree. And I think what's going to be a very, very exciting business case for those who do have cacao is that they have a seven-year or six-year runway where they can milk this, uh, where they can hold on to the cacao. They don't have to sell it all at once and they well, can go but That only works if you've got savings and if you've got resilience. And most cocoa farmers in the world don't. And so they are, you know, if they would have that resilience, if they would have that right. bargaining power, that would be great, but they don't. So they're basically very vulnerable. So what we're seeing these current high prices doing is actually two things. Mm -hmm. Farmers that have a little bit of resilience and a little bit of agency are actually able to negotiate really quite significantly high buying premiums from the buyers mm -hmm. at the moment, right? Um, as one of the traders told me last week that the West African cocoa sector, if you're well organized as a buyer, has all of a sudden become quite liberalized in the last year because you just pay a lot more money on top of it and, and you can get this stuff. But the farmers that are less well organized, usually the ones that are in areas where they shouldn't be or in newly established mm -hmm. farms that aren't in cooperatives or then very hard to reach areas, they are even more vulnerable than usual to the traders because they have such mu so much lower yields. And so their acute cash need is so great that they're willing to even at the moment take a hit in the price as long as right. they get some money. Right. It's like the Dust Bowl days in the U.S. Now, we, we like I grew up reading these stories about the people that were in the Dust Bowl in the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. They were so vulnerable. They would take anything for right. just the most meager and scant of rewards. And that's what we're also seeing. So there's there's really like it's there's not one thing. There's it's a spread. Elements there is there's a spread. And one needs to be very careful. To, to overly generalize here, I think we really mm. need to look at the individual situations to see where the benefits and where the real tragedies lie at the moment. Right. And I guess my point is that we're still right at the beginning of this crisis with regards we don't to... Know. Right. But we know we're not at the end of it. We're, I, I, we're, we're definitely not at the end of it. And as you and I were saying before, when we were off air, anybody who can predict what the price of either cacao or coffee is going to be at the end of the year yeah. is perhaps somebody that you should not be listening to. I or could tell you this. their right are going to be a very, 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 very rich person. <laughs> right. Uh, I would rather, yeah. I, I, I would rather take a guess at what's going to happen at the beginning of next year rather than the end of this year. So uh, yeah. it's, my point is that if you, if you do have cacao and you do have the means and you are listening to this, please remember that the distribution of power is rarely in the favour of the producer. Right now there is something that's yeah. going on that is leaning towards being in favour of the producer. Try and get in contact with people who understand that so that they can help you navigate this. Uh, I have yeah. clients at, that we do help navigate this with and and this podcast is created as a tool to not be advice but 
perhaps to get you in contact with other people who listen to this podcast as well and understand these things. I agree. There's one really important thing. I don't want people to misunderstand the conversation we just had. Mm -hmm. If you are a cocoa producer at the moment, don't put your bag, uh, don't put your cocoa in bags and seal them and wait for, for it to sell them in two years time because I don't know how long this is going to last, but at some point the price will come down and it'll probably come crashing down. So this once in a lifetime high price thing is not the time to hoard your beans. It's to sell them at as high a price as you can. Because right. I would not want to be misconstrued here saying, oh, stick to your beans right now because it's going to go even higher later. I really wouldn't. That's, that's, a, that's a risky bet. Right. And what I would like to say is that this is not advice that mm -hmm. either of us are giving you on this podcast. Yep. The one piece of advice that I do want to give as a consultant in this industry is to say, understand things. Mm -hmm. The majority of the reason that people give up their power is because they believe what people are telling them and they don't get informed. So get informed, understand what your rights are, who you can sell to, who you shouldn't sell to, and start asking questions from people. My clients and I uh, have been asking questions that Nobody has really asked in their area before, and we have seen some significant uh, wins from those things. So all I would do is encourage you to perhaps make a plan and ask questions. Don't do things because I'm, I'm, I want to say something here in particular. I recently mm -hmm. heard a story where a group of buyers had organized and tried to convince this association they should sell their cacao for a specific price. Mm -hmm. One of the people in that organization came to me and said, I don't know what to do because the person who's running the organization is trying to convince us that we should sell for less than what the market is and mm -hmm. that that's our best bet. And my question to this person was, are you sure that this person hasn't been paid off? Now, it's important, folks, for you to understand that just because somebody is the head of something, it doesn't mean that they're not being paid off and that they are 100% working in your interest. So please consider that you are responsible for making the decisions for your business, not somebody else. And if something doesn't feel right, don't do it. And there's a widespread of the quality of governance in cooperatives and the leadership of cooperatives. Isn't there? And, and that's one of the things that when we hear about cooperatives in cocoa or in coffee, et cetera, um, I live in Northwest Europe. And so a lot of people that I speak to about that here have this assumption, as I did as well, that they would look like cooperatives the way that we have them here in Northwest Europe. And there are cooperatives that, to a large extent, operate that way in, in, in kind of the global commodity producer crops. But there's a wide range. Like yes. some cooperatives, they're not <laughs> much more than just... A little office with a list and you can come in there and sell your cocoa to them if you want to and sell them elsewhere if you don't want yeah. to. And that's that's as formalized as the cooperative is as well. So there's there's a, and there's these fantastic cooperatives. Like there's a lady called Leticia in Ghana. She's a uh, she's a cocoa farmer. She makes her own chocolate. She leads this uh, this cooperative of female cocoa farmers called Coco Ma. It's fantastic. I love what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Highly democratic, well organized passionate advocates for what they're doing and there's and there's guys that are crooks and everything in yeah. between there's cooperatives that are not much more than a mailbox somewhere in one of the capitals of these countries and what they do is they fleece farmers for premiums on certification and you've got everything in between there so we need to watch out that we don't use one word when we're talking about a thousand realities exactly Exactly. Thank you for really driving home that point that I was trying to make. I, uh, I think it's really important that producers understand and producers are typically very religious people that have a lot of faith that things will go, you know, as is, you know, their faith dictates and that can mm -hmm. leave them open to being manipulated and tricked, et cetera, et cetera, which, which is what happens here. Anyway, folks, in the next episode, we're going to talk about the poverty that sits behind what's driving producer poverty in cacao. So join us for that episode next. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day.
I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.